go to the bank without going to the bank. But we're excited about it. See how tech companies are leading the financial revolution. This change is coming. It's coming quickly. It's here now. Plus, a terrible accident. I couldn't recognize him at all. And an incredible answer to prayer. You're strong. You're a conqueror. How this man survived a horrific car crash. Jesus will pull you through. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump won a major victory at the Supreme Court yesterday. The court upheld most of the president's travel ban. And it ruled that churches have equal rights to government money. The court is also going to take up another important case this fall involving a Christian baker who didn't want to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Washington. A triumph for President Donald Trump. In a matter of hours, he can implement his executive order on immigration, five months after he signed his name to it. The Supreme Court has agreed to hear his appeal of the so-called travel ban after a number of federal courts blocked it. The court is also allowing the administration to implement most of its 90-day ban on travelers from six Muslim-majority countries that the Trump administration believes pose potential terrorism threats to America's security overturning the lower courts that blocked it. This is a huge victory for President Trump. It's the first legal validation of his controversial executive order since he signed it just one week into his presidency. In a statement, he says, as president, I cannot allow people into our country who want to do us harm. The ruling allows me to use an important tool for protecting our nation's homeland. The court order does allow travelers with a credible claim of a relationship with a person in the U.S. to come into the country. Fair play won today. The Supreme Court also delivered a victory for religious liberty. The court ruled 7-2 in favor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Missouri. The church applied for a grant the state was offering to nonprofits to install a safer rubber surface on their playgrounds. Missouri denied the grant to the church because it's a religious institution, insisting it shouldn't get money from the state. The Supreme Court reversed the decision, calling it odious to our Constitution. Believers, like all people, want equality. Uh, and that's what this court decision has given us today, is that when the government creates a program, religious people can't be told to stay outside, uh, that we're second-class citizens. It was the first religious rights case heard by Justice Neil Gorsuch. In a separate opinion, Gorsuch, joined by Justice Clarence Thomas, clarified that the case should be applied broadly throughout the country to make clear discrimination against religious practice isn't tolerated on the playground or anywhere else. The court also announced it will weigh in on another issue important to Christians and other people of faith this fall. The justices agreed to hear a case to consider whether a baker can refuse to make a wedding cake for a gay couple because he objects to same-sex marriage based on his Christian beliefs. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Well, the conservatives on the court seem to be emboldened. They're taking on more and more controversial cases. Past years, it seems they wanted to duck, the, duck them and not consider them, but they're taking them head on. In other news, President Trump will have an important meeting with the president of South Korea later this week. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. A key topic on the agenda for the two leaders, their concerns about North Korea's progress in building nuclear weapons and an arsenal of missiles to carry them. National security correspondent Eric Rosales reports on the upcoming discussion and what the Trump administration hopes to gain from it. Over the weekend, members of the North Korean Youth League and others in the communist state declared in a series of statements that if the United States dares to ignite a war, they will wipe out the enemies once and for all and make them pay for the bloodshed. The demonstration came shortly before South Korean President Moon Jae-in's visit to the United States. President Moon has been a sharp critic of his neighbors to the north and its dictator Kim Jong-un. 
During a recent CBS News interview, the South Korean leader said the northern regime should quickly return everyone who's been detained. Even today, there are many Korean nationals and American citizens who are detained in North Korea. I also urge North Korea to return these people to their families. President Moon also said Pyongyang had a heavy responsibility in the death of American citizen Otto Warmbier. The 22-year-old college student spent 17 months in prison in North Korea, only to be released to the United States in a comatose state. Warmbier died just days after coming home. But in the same breath, the South Korean president says he hopes to draw North Korea into negotiations about its nuclear program by the end of the year. He also says that the United States should and could wait on any military action. I believe that dialogue is necessary. We were unable to resolve the North Korean nuclear issue through only the sanctions and pressure. It is a very uh, valid political position for a, a, a Korean um, politician to have, but it's also a stark break with the last two Korean presidents uh, who have largely been in lockstep with the United States on holding a hard line against North Korea. Asia Pacific security researcher Harry Kresha says President Moon is the son of North Korean refugees and knows better than anyone about how families are still separated an open wound for the Korean society. President Moon, a liberal who favors a softer approach to North Korea than his conservative predecessors, has said publicly that he would meet with the North Korean leader if circumstances are right. But Moon has challenged the United States, saying Seoul should reconsider its deployment of the advanced U.S. missile defense system, which is currently in South Korea. After having seen two of the, uh, I believe it's total six missile launchers that uh, are eventually meant to be installed in this uh, missile system, missile defense system. He's hoping to see a, a more thorough environmental review on the last four. It's unclear President Moon plans to remove the U.S. defense system altogether or just wants to slow its rollout. Meanwhile, with each passing day, North Korea continues to speed up its pursuit of developing nuclear armed missiles capable of reaching the U.S. mainland. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Eric. Demonstrators came to the White House Monday to protest as President Trump met with India's leader, the world's largest democracy. The protesters voiced their concerns about India's growing assault on religious freedom. George Thomas brings us that story. It was a bear hug President Trump wasn't expecting. Nonetheless, for India's visiting prime minister, it was a sentiment that the U.S. and India share a strong bond. I would like to invite you to India along with your family, and I hope that you will give me the opportunity to welcome you and host you in India. Modi and Trump spoke in the Rose Garden on Monday after holding bilateral meetings on a host of economic and other issues, including an agreement to fight against radical Islamic terrorism. Both our nations have been struck by the evils of terrorism, and we are both determined to destroy terrorist organizations and the radical ideology that drives them. While the two leaders met, demonstrators outside the White House called on President Trump to challenge India's prime minister on his human rights record. Christians and Sikhs have seen a rise in religious persecution since Modi's Hindu-led government came to power. We're here today basically to raise awareness of the human rights violations that are happening within India. Open Doors, a group that monitors religious freedom around the world, lists India as the 15th most dangerous place in the world for Christians to live. When Modi came into power in 2014, he promised the Christians and other minorities that he would allow freedom of religion. He lied. The only people that have favored status in India is not all people, it's the Hindu nationalists. It's the far extremist party that tends to violence. John Lutembeka, a Tanzanian missionary to India, where is Modi's government is trying to turn India, a secular nation, into a Hindu country. I am here to speak for the Indian church the Indians who are being persecuted by Prime Minister Modi, by a group of radical Hindus. Christians have been killed, women have been raped, and the Hindu is taking more part in India, and it wants to turn India into a Hindu nation. Lutembeka says good relations between the two countries means the United States should be willing to confront the often violent Hindu nationalism that is threatening to damage India's historically tolerant and pluralistic society. George Thomas, CBN News. A disturbing rise in intolerance and violence. Gordon? 
Well, this is a long history with the BJP going back to the 1990s, and, and their rise to political power was based on uh, a, a Hindu-only uh, slogan that India was for Hindus and that the religious minorities, uh, significantly uh, the Muslims, uh, many people don't know this, but India has one of the largest Muslim populations in the world. Uh, and so the, the Christians were persecuted in the 1990s when the BJP first took power. Uh, they actually have an enforcement group of radicals. They call them the RSS. Uh, and they've been responsible for many attacks on churches, uh, many persecutions against religious minorities, Sikhs, Muslims. Uh, we'll see, though. Modi seems to be moderating as prime minister. He wasn't when he was governor of Gujarat. Uh, under his leadership there, it's one of the most horrific attacks against uh, a religious minority in history, where a whole trainload of Muslims was uh, massacred. It was absolutely horrific. Uh, but we'll see, as prime minister, can he, can he moderate? The U.S. and India have some natural ties, and India has a secular government, uh, and they claim to be a democracy. Under their constitution, there is freedom of religion. Uh, but it's up to the government to enforce those principles. They need to be more than aspirational. They need to be real. Terry? Well, up next, the new trend in banking, and the millennials are leading the charge. I use my Venmo app. I use my Bank of America app. Just everything can be done on my phone, which is great. My bank doesn't have any physical locations. I really do all of mine on my phone. Digital banking is not just for the young. See how it can benefit older adults even more when we come back. Well, if you want to see the future of banking and your money, it's right on your cell phone. The idea is to make it easy for you to deal with your finances from anywhere at any time. Caitlin Burke brings us that story. The banking industry is bracing for change thanks to the all-powerful digital revolution. Okay. The financial technology or fintech is really changing the way fundamentally that customers interact with their bank. Banking expert Rob Morgan says customers expect the same type of digital access to banking as they get with other important services. Take a second to think about it. I can get my mail on here, order dinner, even hail a cab. And now, thanks to financial technology, I can also access my money. In terms of banks and non-banks in the space, there are a number of players. And really, banks are looking pretty actively to partner in the space. So banks are looking, and as are these new companies, to work together to deliver the customer the best experience. Apple, Google, Amazon, the tech giants are all on board. Most are starting off with digital payment apps. They believe that um, this modernization of the banking sector is going to make uh, financial services more accessible, more affordable, and ultimately more secure. Brian Peters is with Financial Innovation Now, an organization that represents Apple, Amazon, Google, Intuit, and PayPal. I think whenever you have a little bit of competition and a little bit of change, it's tough. People uh, need a little bit of time to accommodate. But uh, this change is coming. It's coming quickly. Uh, it's here now, uh, and uh, we're here to help policymakers understand uh, why this is good, good for consumers. While they may be a little late to the party, major banks have entered this new reality. You see banks all across the spectrum investing in things like innovation labs, where they're delivering these new products directly to customers. While banks are competing in this space, they face an uphill battle. According to the Harris Research Firm, 77% of consumers have a positive impression of the tech industry, compared to 35% who feel good about the financial industry. We see a lot of partnerships. So uh, it, it could be characterized as a big battle between Wall Street and Silicon Valley. But at the end of the day, we actually see a lot more nuance. Uh, there will be some skirmishes, and we're going to have a great, robust discussion about how to enable this technological future. Uh, but, but we're excited about it. Those skirmishes seem to be taking the shape of regulations. The tech industry wants breathing room for young startups, while the banking industry believes its new competitors should follow the same rules that it does. Today, there are a lot of rules and regulations in place that provide protections for consumers. And you need to make sure that those protections are being applied equally across the board. We're hopeful that policymakers can uh, find ways to 
uh, uh, minimize some of the early regulatory impact uh, that they may face uh, so that they can at least get off the ground, uh, prove their business model, and, and actually bring something to market. Security is a major concern of consumers when it comes to these new digital financial services. But Peter says your cell phone will eventually provide better protection of your information than a debit or credit card. When you think about making a payment or storing financial information on your smartphone, that smartphone is encrypted in a variety of ways. Uh, to gain access to it on the later models now, you have to use uh, biometric fingerprint authentication. Because of all that additional security, uh, you have now both greater convenience and greater security. That didn't exist before. Some of the most popular new services include Venmo, Google Wallet, and Apple Pay. They allow you to transfer money and buy products without ever stepping into a bank or pulling out your credit card. This especially appeals to the millennial generation. According to Viacom Media, 73% of millennials prefer using digital services than going to a bank. I think you can use your smartphone for everything. I use my Venmo app, I use my Bank of America app, just everything can be done on my phone, which is great. My bank doesn't have any physical locations. I really do all of mine on my phone. But it's not millennials who stand to gain the most from this technology. Uh, there is a proportionally bigger opportunity to help older generations because if you uh, can't get around very easily, um, if you're in a small town where the bank branch is far away, uh, managing your finances can be tough. I recently got my grandfather hooked on taking care of some of his finances digitally. Hi, Poppy. Hey, babe. A few visits ago, I set you up with some um, new ways to do your banking. Why were you interested in doing your banking digitally? Well, it seemed to be uh, convenient and fast. Uh, also, it seemed to be cheap, no stamps, no envelopes, and the security was good because uh, it has had two passwords, one to get into the smartphone and one to get in the account. So all of those reasons, uh, it, and they all proved out, too. I, I find out all the time that there's new things that I can uh, apply and play with, and it's, uh, it's uh, fun and it's also interesting. Despite battles on Capitol Hill, both the banks and tech industry agree that ultimately the consumer will be the winner. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. I'm not sure I'm ready to go to my smartphone to start paying for things, but it, the, this technology is taking off, and, and I, I know it in my children, they're, they're all on board with it. I still like to write checks. I don't know what it is about me, but I still like those paper checks and... I like to know my banker. I like to have an eyeball to eyeball contact. And when I have a problem, I like to know there's somebody <laughs> there's I can somebody talk I to. There's somebody I can actually talk yes. to. Yeah. <laughs> well, coming up, a car crash leaves one pastor in critical condition. They said, I'm sorry, your husband is between life and death. I felt helpless. Watch him make a miraculous recovery when we come back. Raul de la Mata had just finished preaching one Sunday afternoon when he loaded his family into his minivan. He was driving along a strip of road he called the safest expressway. And then before he had a chance to react, he heard his wife scream and saw a big black Audi hurtling towards his car. All he, he could do was turn the wheel. It was just a screeching sound and it was over. A car lost control, crossed the median, and slammed into a minivan, which was carrying a family of five. In the van were Pastor Raul de la Mata, his wife Elizabeth, and their three children. I was just so disturbed by the sight of my eyes, and the first thing I did was cry out to the Lord for his help. Elizabeth and the younger children had minor injuries, while their teenage daughter suffered some broken bones but would recover. Raul, on the other hand, was airlifted to Loyola Hospital in critical condition. They said, I'm sorry, your husband is between life and death. I felt helpless. Raul suffered multiple fractures in his arm, femur, and pelvis. But the doctor's main concern was keeping him alive. His blood pressure was at critical levels, 
a sign there was internal bleeding. Dr. Michael Stover was his lead orthopedic surgeon. When you have injuries to your pelvis, especially in a car accident, that's kind of a marker for other organs to be injured. After hours of searching, doctors found a vein in his pelvis that had been severed. They stopped the bleeding and waited for him to stabilize. Meanwhile, Elizabeth called on their church to pray. They were praying for life, that he not die, that he live, that he'd be able to walk, that he'd be able to continue preaching. It was hours before Elizabeth was allowed to see her husband, who was in and out of consciousness. I was devastated with the sight that I saw. I couldn't recognize him at all. I held my tears and I wanted to be a strong wife. And I told him, honey, we are all okay. We love you. We're praying for you and you're gonna get through this and you're strong, you're a conqueror. Prayer continued throughout the night. And by morning, Raul had stabilized. Doctors began repairing the fractures and searching for signs of internal damage. Elizabeth remembers getting the news. No internal organs were punctured. When the doctor told me that, he said, it's just broken bones. We can work with broken bones. That for me was very peaceful. And I said, thank you, Lord, because you've heard our prayers. But Raul still faced a long, hard recovery. In the span of seven days, he went through numerous reconstructive surgeries. Afterwards, he woke up and was coherent for the first time since the accident. Dr. Stover came in. All I remember him saying is, you were involved in a very severe car accident and you're not gonna be able to walk for at least two years. It felt like I put all my dreams in a firecracker and they just blew up. Literally, I said, what, what am I gonna do with my life? Not to be able to stand up, not to be able to play with my children, not to be able to play tennis with my son. It felt hopeless. It felt like either the Lord does something or, or, or I, I, that's it, my story's done. Raul, his family, and others prayed as he began rigorous physical therapy. It was such a hard process to see him go through that, but he was very strong and he decided to get better. Raul progressed faster than anyone expected. Then, after only 11 months of therapy, he was back on his feet. From the walker to the crutches, from the crutches to the cane, then from the cane to holding on to someone, and then I was finally able to walk. Not two years as the doctors had said, Today, Raul walks without any issues. And when he and Elizabeth aren't pastoring their church in Illinois, they're traveling the world, sharing their story. It doesn't matter how dark the situation looks, the love and the light of Jesus will pull you through. Cry out to God, our Savior, and He will help us. He will help you, and He will meet you at your situation. Cry out, and He will help you. This story reminds me of when Jesus came to a cripple lying by the pool of Bethsaida. And he said, um, do you want me to heal you? And in this, Raul, he decided to get better. You know, so often we let doctor's reports influence us. And, you know, it's going to be two years before you walk or You've you know, got so many months to live, or you're going to have this forever. These kinds of reports get deep within us, and, and we lose the will to say, I want to get better. Have that, have that, I want to get better. Jesus responds to that. And when you say yes, that's when the miracle happened. And, and you, you just have that faith that, Yes, he is able. I am able. Together we can get through this. Together we can see a miracle and I can recover. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. Before we pray, we want to encourage you with some others who've had miracle healing. Here's Leanna of Fontana, California. She had bone spurs in her feet, severe pain. Watching the 700 Club, Terry said, you have problems with your feet. They are sore and painful. 
Well, she claimed the word, word and immediately felt the pain leave her feet, and she has not had any more trouble. Hallelujah. This is Stephanie. Stephanie lives in Aurora, Nebraska. She injured her left knee 20 years ago from running. Mm -hmm. One day she was watching this program. Gordon, you gave this word of knowledge. There's a woman who has a left knee that's causing you a great deal of pain. You just heard me and you're wondering if you can trust that the healing is for you. The answer is yes, you can trust it. So Stephanie claimed that word and after the prayer, she felt heat come into her knee. She said she jumped up and walked around and was pain free. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That is wonderful. Cry out to God. It's one of the keys to miracles, the cry out. Uh, he always responds to the cries of his children. And just come to him with your need, knowing that he has already paid the price. By his stripes, we were healed. Mm -hmm. You know you can get the answer. So cry out. Be that importune prayer that cries out and says, yes, I need an answer today. Son of David, have mercy on me. That's the prayer of blind Bartimaeus. Son of David, have mercy on me. And his prayer got an answer. If you do the same thing, the same result will happen. So we're going to pray. You cry out in an act of faith. Lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. And we'll agree with you. And we'll let Jesus do all the rest. Lord, we lift the needs to you right now. And we just know that you are the God who heals. It's in your very name. You are the God who heals. So we come to you with thanksgiving. And we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. So Lord, stretch forth your hand as people are laying hands on that area that needs healing, stretch forth your hand. As people are crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Respond in your love and heal their disease now in Jesus' name. There's someone you're watching, you heard the report about the left knee, and you're going, my left knee is, he is hurting. Can I be healed? And the answer for you is yes, you can. Right now, just lay your hand on that knee and receive miracle healing into it in Jesus' name. God is able to restore cartilage. He's able to re-knit tendons together. He's able to do it all. So in Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Terry? As someone else, you've suffered from tinnitus, that ringing in your ears for many, many years. and. Right now, in Jesus' name, it's stopping. You'll know it's you because you've become so accustomed to it, you almost don't notice it anymore, but it's going to get very quiet as God heals you. And someone else, you've been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. God's healing that for you right now. That spasming and burning and difficulty swallowing is just gone in Jesus' name. There's someone you've had shingles and it's on the right side on your back and God is just healing those nerves. In Jesus' name, he's taking away that infection and that virus from you. Thanks. In the name of Jesus, be healed and be made, made whole. Someone else with arthritis in your fingers, and it's um, primarily in your right hand, but it affects both in the large knuckles and, and inflamed. Uh, Jesus is healing you right now. What you couldn't do before, if you couldn't button a button, try to button a button and see that the pain is gone. You have new... Uh, your, your fingers are now limber. Lord, we thank you for you are the healer. You are the restorer. You are the forgiver. You are our all in all. We thank you for what you're doing, what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. If you need prayer, we're here for you. And we're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. And it's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. So call us. Terry? Well, still ahead, watch as a single mother of five gets a brand new home after her last one collapsed in a cloud of dust. Her story is coming up. And welcome back to the 700 Club. 
Americans may be divided, but they still largely agree on one thing, saying grace before meals. A new poll by the Washington Post and the Kaiser Family Foundation finds that about half of all Americans say a prayer over their food at least a few times a week. But there are some differences. 74% of white evangelicals and 80% of black Protestants say grace, compared to 31% of white mainline or non-evangelical Protestants. And 52% of Catholics say grace. 62% of Republicans say, say grace, compared to just 43% of Democrats. NFL star Derek Carr says he will tithe off of his lucrative new contract. The quarterback just signed a five-year, $125 million deal with the Oakland Raiders. That's the highest in the league's history. Last December, Carr suffered from a season-ending injury, but now he's back. He was asked what he's going to do with all that money. First thing I'll do is I'll pay my tithe like I have since I was in college getting $700 on a scholarship check, um, you know, uh, that, that won't change. I'll do that. It's going to be a big tithe. Carr says he will also use the money to help others around the world and eat healthy at Chick-fil-A. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In Honduras, a single mother and her children lived in a small shelter they had built themselves. It wasn't safe, but it was all they could afford. They built their house with scraps of wood, cloth, and cardboard. It was rickety at best, made worse by the main support beam, which had cracked under the weight of the metal roof. 12-year-old Johanna and her family never felt safe. Every time the wind blew, we heard cracking sounds in the wood. We were afraid. Zeta is Joanna's mom. To put food on the table, this single mother of five sold tortillas and did laundry for a few customers. Then one day, the support beam finally broke. And their house collapsed in front of them. The family rallied, cutting trees and salvaging what they could to build this lean-to shelter against the side of a hill. But shelter wasn't their only need. One of the fallen beams crushed Zeta's stove. Without it, there was little money for food or other expenses. My mom had promised me we were going to eat, but I went to sleep without anything to eat. I asked God, why? Why? Thanks to a call from Zeta's friend, Operation Blessing connected with the family, and we started construction. I thank God and Operation Blessing because they are helping us to build a new house. We built the house on a concrete block foundation with walls and a roof designed to last. Then we gave Zeta a new, more efficient stove and supplies to restart her tortilla business. She told us she made more money in the first three days with the new stove than she made in two weeks with the old one. I give thanks to Operation Blessing because I know it was God who sent them to us. <laughs> I'm sure all of heaven is quiet when a widow cries out from her heart and says, God, what can I do? Here's a mom with a bunch of children. She's raising them alone. They've tried to build their own lean-to house. I mean, you know from the get-go, it's just not going to work. And then trouble comes. Something unexpected happens. There's no hope in that scenario. But you bring hope, 700 Club members. It's the thing you specialize in. And we want to say thank you to those of you that belong to the 700 Club because you are touching and changing lives right at their point of need all around the world. To the rest of you, if you haven't joined the 700 Club, I can't think of a better time to do it. You can go to your phone right now. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. A general membership is 65 cents a day, $20 a month. But when you call, ask them to tell you about the different club levels, and then you decide what you'd like to do. When you make that call today, our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest DVD. It's called Miracles. It will be a faith builder in your life as he shares from the Word of God and also the testimonies of people who have experienced the miraculous healing power of God. We want you to have this, and we welcome you. 
to the work that's done around the world from here at CBN because of people just like you. Well, up next, she was getting ready to celebrate her 10th anniversary, and that's when she was blindsided by her husband. Writer Shauna Shanks tells us how it shattered her world and how she put the pieces back together. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Shauna Shanks was the creative director for the children's ministry at her church. A few years ago, she went off to a weekend conference. There, she was able to take a breather from her busy life and do a little soul searching along the way. Then, just one day after she got back from that conference, her husband of nearly 10 years dropped a bomb on her. In 2013, Shauna Shanks was a month shy of celebrating her 10-year anniversary when her husband calmly asked for a divorce. Two weeks later, he admitted to having an affair. Though her husband was telling her their marriage was over, God was saying something else. God was tasking me to do the hardest thing I'd ever done, loving my husband. In her book, A Fierce Love, Shauna shares why she's telling the world about his affair and what she relied on to restore their marriage. Shauna Shanks is here with us now. Shauna, welcome to the 700 Club. Hi, thanks for having me today. Great to have you here. When your husband broke this news to you, I mean, you were shocked. This wasn't something you saw coming. No, no, it completely took me off guard. Um, we had three little kids at the time. Um, you know, I just figured that our marriage stuff was normal, like everybody had it, where you just kind of go through lows and highs. But I had no idea that he was that unhappy. I just wasn't expecting it at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, his attitude was really pretty cut and dried. I mean, it wasn't like mm -hmm. he was saying, I'm thinking about this, or mm -hmm. I might want to do this. I mean, he pretty much said, I don't love you anymore. Yeah, and that's, that's not his usual nature. Like, um, he's usually soft with me, and um, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't know how to react to it because I just had never thought anything like that could happen. Um, but in his mind, he had already made it, made the decision. And I think it, he just thought it would be easier if he would just kind of rip the bandaid off. And, mm -hmm. you know, he had already mentally checked out of the marriage. So I think he was just wanted, did that on purpose. What happened then? How did you react? And how, what about your children? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of my reaction was, um, beyond the initial heartbreak of losing my husband, you know, I, as women, we want to fix things. And I automatically start thinking like, okay, like what about this mortgage? What about the kids' school if we split up? And will I miss them if, if I don't have them on the weekends? You know, all those yeah. things start going through my mind. Um, and so I just, I wasn't sleeping. And I knew that I had to get up in a couple hours with the kids. Um, so I knew that I needed to pull myself together. So I just kind of begged for the Lord. I said, God, please just give me one thing I can focus on so that I can calm my thoughts and get some sleep. And um, that's, that's when it all started. He answered me that night and he said to hope and endure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was really the turning point for you mm -hmm. in what God was asking you to do. I mean, he, he actually gave you 1 Corinthians 13 mm -hmm. as verses you were to look at. And I loved what you said in your book because I thought that probably would have been my reaction. I know those verses. Yeah. I've, I've not only read those verses a hundred times myself, I've heard them at every wedding and yeah. every... So how did God use such a familiar verse or verses, such a set of familiar verses to really pierce your heart. Yeah. I mean, I'm the same as you. I'm a church girl. And so I was like, God, I know that one. Yeah. <laughs> you must not have known that, but I already know that one. So, um, but in this context of my husband asking me for a divorce and him taking me back there, um, I just kind of became obsessed with those things. Um, love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not rude. Um, it's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. And it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. So in the context of, you know, my marriage imploding, mm -hmm. the verses that I thought were so easy um, became the biggest challenge. And two weeks after he asked me for the divorce is when I found out that he was having an affair. So I'd already had two weeks worth of um, what I end up calling in the book a love filter. <laughs> so if my actions and reactions and even thoughts toward my husband didn't line up with the things in that scripture, 
ang you know, not to be angry, not to keep a record of wrong, not to be jealous. Yeah. If my thoughts didn't line up to those things, um, I just really felt challenged by the Lord not to let them pass through. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had already started working in that discipline when I found out he was having the affair. So I was able to react to him way differently than, than, than I have. normally would have. Because it's mm -hmm. not that verse in 1 Corinthians 13 is actually, I don't know if people know this, like I didn't know this, it's not our normal human instinct to, to right. love that way. Right. So um, I guess, yeah, it was Without the biggest God, challenge. you aren't getting there from right. here. And I yeah. think it's only possible through the power, being empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing that I think was so, um, you were so candid about this in your book mm -hmm. was, your husband didn't change in that beginning time because right. you used this as your love filter, mm -hmm. but you changed. Mm -hmm. How did God change you? Um, I think that, first of all, the love filter just kept me busy because I'm thinking of what I was working on. So mm -hmm. instead of becoming obsessed with what he was doing and worried about what he was doing and being heartbroken by what he was doing, I was busy because I was busy filtering, okay, is my are my thoughts lining up to the scripture? Am mm -hmm. I doing what God has tasked me to do? Because ultimately, you know, I have to stand before God someday, not according to what everyone's done to me, but what I've done in, in obedience yeah. to the Lord, what He has told me to do. I could have pretended that I didn't hear God speak to me, but I did <laughs> hear Him, and He did tell me to do that. So. You know, one of the things that you, one of the terms that you used in the book was you described Micah's attitude during that time as blatant mm -hmm. indifference, which is almost worse than anger. You know, it it's was. just kind That's... of like a, a wall that you run yeah. into. But God really spoke to you mm. again about your blatant indifference. Yeah, because, you know, I think that I just wanted to be like, he's done this. He's the, you know, the blatant perpetrator, reason. Yeah. <laughs> but God kept turning things around on me. Um, so I remember that night he was, I was, you know, sitting on one couch because he didn't leave the house. He was laying on another, scrolling through face, you know, mm, social media, um, was watching a football game. And he was just so nonchalant. And I'm devastated. My world, I'm worried about the kids. My world is being turned upside down. I'm heartbroken. And I just thought, how dare you mm -hmm. be that indifferent about our relationship? How dare you? And a few days later, and I wrote in my journal, that's where this book came from, was my, all of my journal entries. <laughs> and I wrote down, like, he is blatantly indifferent. And the Lord put my nose in that journal a couple of days later. And he said, listen, young lady, like you promised to give your life to me and to serve me and to follow me. And you do the same thing to me. You're not serving me actively. Your heart is not actively with me. We do not have a strong relationship. You are blatantly indifferent. And how can you be upset that he is doing that when you are doing the same thing? Wow. And so it was God being that real to me and speaking like that, it was very humbling. Yeah, well, humbling and as you said, really kind of turned the tables mm -hmm. on where your focus went, but in a good way, mm -hmm. ultimately. Talk about reconciliation. What did God do in your marriage? So um, everyone asked me like, well, what was the moment that changed it? You know, there wasn't like one moment, although there is a chapter called Lord of the Ring where he does end up giving me my ring back. But I think um, there's ebbs and flows in the healing process where one day I would see his heart changing toward me and I would be filled with hope. And then the next day, you know, this is too, this is a mess, you know, mm -hmm. and just kind of take some steps backwards. So I think for me personally, I had to be healed in Christ because the damage in our marriage had already um, was already too far. So um, at, at some point, like I stopped praying for our marriage even. And I was just praying, you know, that um, God would redeem his soul and that he would find him. Mm -hmm. And I'm just working on my own self. I really think that I, I had to know who my identity was in Christ before I could be healed um, and move on with my husband. Yeah. And your marriage today? Uh, my marriage today, uh, we call it a first and a second marriage <laughs> because even though we didn't officially get a divorce, it is nothing like the first marriage um, where both of us were blatantly indifferent towards each other and towards the Lord. And now um, through this season of finding redemption and just, you know, being able to, you know, tangibly understand the work of the cross in our own personal lives. Um, I think that we have purpose um, and we know what we're here on this earth for instead of just mm -hmm. being lazy and... And what an impact it will have on mm -hmm. your children as well as those who read your book. Mm -hmm. I just want to say the book is called A Fierce Love. We have only scratched the surface of Shauna's story, but if you'd like to get more, get the book. It's available nationwide wherever books are sold and it's candor and um, the questions that it will cause you to ask in your own soul, I think will change your life and change your relationship. Shauna, thank you so much Thanks for being so much. with us. Great Thanks for to having have me. Your wonderful book. Well, still ahead,
we're going to be answering your email questions, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Thank you. Well, the DVD is now available, and I want you to have it so that you can understand the headlines from the Middle East that are happening today. What's the source of the conflict between the Palestinian Authority and Israel? What's the struggle, to, again, to this day, 50 years later, over Jerusalem, uh, the right to return, all of these things? If you know the story of the Six-Day War, you can understand the headlines. And so you get this story from the point of view of the paratroopers who actually fought the battles. It's yours for a gift of $15, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, it's time for some Bring It On, so if you've got You're some right. questions. I sure do. This first one comes from Beverly Gordon, who says, I am a mother and grandmother. My children profess they are born again by the blood of Jesus, but my son and daughter are getting further away from God and the church. They believe because they tithe, everything is good. My 16-year-old grandson that was raised in church and a Christian school is into drugs. His parents would rather jet set everywhere than address the issue, and even if they do address it, they never follow through. Please pray for my family. Is there anything I can do? Uh, Beverly, I think you're hitting the number one thing you can do, which is pray. Uh, and pray uh, for both your, your, your children and your grandchildren, and realize the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much, and so do that. And pray specifically that their hearts would turn back to God, that they would become once again on fire for Him. Uh, for your grandson, uh, the warnings about drugs are all over the place. I would bring those to his attention and let him know the new medical research showing how drugs literally rewire the brain to create cravings for even more. It's tough for a 16-year-old to understand the permanent implications they're taking with their brain chemistry uh, when they're taking these things, but there's a reason they're habit forming, and the reason is in the chemistry within the drug itself. It rewires your brain so that you now have a craving for it. Get him educated on what he's doing uh, to himself, and don't let bad companies spoil him. Uh, get him. Get him educated. He has to make the decision, though, to stop. It's got to come from him. It can't come ex externally. Uh, there's no prison you can create that will stop him. So uh, realize he's got to come to that conclusion, and he needs prayer, and he needs you. Okay, this is Ren who says, my boyfriend and I have been dating for a while. I'm only 17 years old. My boyfriend is a great person. He's a Christian, he treats me well, and we read the Bible together and pray together on a regular basis. We've both prayed about our relationship. He feels God has told him that we will eventually marry and both sets of our parents feel the same. I haven't received such a clear answer. With that said, we are both, quote, bored. I don't feel like I'm my fun-loving self around him anymore. In groups, we're fine, but when we're alone, we aren't content. Is this a sign that I shouldn't consider a future with him? Uh, Ren, yeah, I would say. Uh, if you're bored at 17 with your boyfriend, um, okay. Um, you know, if it, if it can't last at this point in your life, uh, start thinking about your 50th anniversary. Uh, what's that going to mean? And what's that life going to be like? You're 17, you have your whole life in front of you. Uh, you don't really find out who you really are until your 30s, so uh, wait. Uh, get educated, uh, and I would, if I were you, I'd wait. Here's a word from Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him.